there. My name is Jessica Crow, and I'm the founder of Apogee and the host of Change Leader Insights, which is a podcast all about leadership and change. And we look at it from a couple of different dimensions, three to be exact, self-leadership, team leadership, and change leadership. And I'm really excited because I have John Saunders here with me today, and he is, I'll give you a quick bio, and then I'll let him introduce himself. So John spent more than 20 years as a Wall Street senior vice president. He was a sales team leader and an award-winning sales executive. Now he's an executive coach, an author, a podcast host. He's been on many podcasts. He's spoken at international conferences and universities. He's a he's very involved in many different things. And we actually were just joking today because he's now a top relationship building voice on LinkedIn as well, which is very yes. impressive. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have him here. We're going to be talking about the power of storytelling. But before that, John, can you share a little bit more detail about kind of who you are and how you got to where you are today in your in your career? Uh, happy to, Jessica. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I went to, when I was, you know, an undergraduate and just sort of growing up, investing was always a part of my life. My parents always had investing magazines around the house okay, and, we'd watch these, cool. and I would watch these different shows with my dad sometimes and Louis Rukeyser <laughs> report, if anyone has ever heard of that one, no, <laughs> really dating myself. That's cool, though. <laughs> and, you know, I got done with school and I really wanted to work in, in uh, Wall Street and, and financial services. And I really wanted to move to New York. I just, it was always a dream. I grew up in Wisconsin and I just never thought it would happen. You know, yeah. I, my parents weren't going to sort of finance my move out there. So I was, sort of, I was looking for jobs in the Midwest. Well, lo and behold, I started telling a few friends like, hey, I kind of want to move to New York. I think that would be awesome. And suddenly a little door cracked open, you know, hey, yeah. talk to this person. And then I told another person, and lo and behold, enough doors cracked open. Suddenly I'm moving to New York City, started out as a sales assistant. And I really focused my entire time on, I was always, you know, very competitive person, played sports. Mm -hmm. Focus my time on, you know, how do I always operate more efficiently and effectively and like drive impact? That was kind of my yeah. early mindset. And I kept trying that and trying that. And, you know, once in a while, I'd run into some walls every few years and feel sort of stuck. And I'd go to somebody and I'd say, hey, I'm sort of feeling stuck here. What would you do here if you were me? And one of the stories from my book you mentioned earlier was yeah. a mentor told me, hey, uh, why don't you go out and do something outside the company and volunteer? And you know, sort of find some skills, build your skills that way to help you get promoted. I, I'd been passed over for a few promotions. Yeah. And so I went out, told my friends, I'm working on Wall Street and doing this on nights and weekends and lunchtime. And I became, ended up getting uh, a title sponsor for the New York Underground Film Festival. The only one they had in 25 years, it was Jameson Irish Whiskey. And Very just turned cool. this event into this sort of much bigger thing. But I, it was really, that story was about like, getting outside your comfort zone, learning new skills and really realizing that selling and, and, creating influence is about getting other people's buy-in through stories. Yeah. And that's what I yeah. did. I really helped understand their story and I went out and sold it to Jameson. And I've just always taken that approach and it's been really a thread throughout my career. 23 years on Wall Street, going from assistant to director and now as a coach. Yeah, led you throughout uh, each point in your journey, which is so incredible. And that is, there's a um, part of the intro of the book that you wrote, The Optimizer, Building and Leading a Team of Serial Innovators. And I I loved it because it was such a great way of characterizing how how do you make an impact? How do you get people to buy in? And the people who are listening to this podcast, this show, that is a question that is top of mind for them. How do I make an impact? How do I uh, get people's buy-in when I'm responsible for a change initiative, when I'm leading change at scale because it is so hard? And what you did that, you know, that one story, and I, I know you've got uh, many it, it really explains the value of building that connection through the art and act of storytelling, uh, which is, which is really great. So how would, you know, in, to, to kind of break it down for somebody who's like, Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm teed up. I'm listening to this. I want to improve how I utilize storytelling to influence, to um, get that buy-in from others. What are some tips you could share with, with people who are listening to this show or watching? Right. <laughs> Right. And stories are, I'll first say, very formulaic. Yeah. And once you see them, once you see that formula, it's hard to unsee it. Uh, there's an interesting book out there called The Seven Story Plots or Seven Plots of Stories or something like this. Yeah. And once you see those seven, every Disney movie you watch, you'll be like, oh, that's that one. Oh. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the hero. That's the explorer. You know, yeah. You know, they all follow the same formula. And the reason that it's so important to follow that formula is people have a 
we all have a cognitive load. We can only sort of take on so much. Mm -hmm. And when you overwhelm someone with details and all of these things about a story and kind of meander all over the place, we get overloaded and we tune out. We go to our phone, right. we turn on Instagram, whatever, and we start to, to fan it, to uh, lose attention. And so it's so important to have that structure to that story. But before you even get there, it's really having clarity of, of your what, you know, what do you do? How do you do it? Uh, why do you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, so, and where do you want to take this thing? That's really, I'm talking about mission and vision. Like what's your ideal where in the future? And then the big question I like to ask is, all right, who would win from helping this story uh, yeah. from, from participating or helping you, uh, you know, using your product or service. Yeah. And when you get that sort of clarity of those things, then you can start to identify those stories to help really get people's buy-in for that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And again, thinking about it from the lens of someone who in a company is responsible for getting implementing a change and getting people to want to use it or uh, follow along or whatever it is, that that storytelling piece would make that connection so much quicker versus saying, here's the data, here are the stats, here are why, you know, here are the facts. Yes, those are important. That's part of the strategy and the reasons why the decision to change was made, but that's not going to get me who's extremely busy at work and has things going on in my life at home, that's not going to connect me <laughs> to the, the reasons. And so really getting clear on your why, your purpose, your mission, vision, that makes a lot of sense. And um, when you and I had talked uh, previously, you told me a really great story that I think people would love to hear. And it's about this woman who wrote a book and you have to give the whole tea up. And I know it's, it's uh, it, I, you got to share the story because it was so good. It really helped crystallize how you leverage that storytelling piece to get her from where she was to an international journey um, that we went abroad with it. <laughs> it really, and, and what's fascinating about the story for, for me, of course, there are many things, I suppose it's my story, but it's so, it's such a parallel to the film festival story from yeah. 1999. It was really, yeah. so this, uh, this gal, I was doing some coaching for a book publisher at uh, the same program uh, I went through. They hired me to do some coaching after I wrote the book. And this, uh, I typically work with thought leadership type books and innovation, things like this. This one gal found me teaching a class and she wrote a nonfiction, a fiction book called uh, The Wildlife Divas. And uh, these five young girls of color go to Uganda and save the mountain gorilla. And she calls me up one day, hey, can we do a coaching call? Sure. We get on Zoom. She's in California, 60-ish uh, or so year old, uh, retired African-American woman. And she said, John, I'm an introvert and I've never sold anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, that's an interesting starting point. And I literally <laughs> took her through the exercise. You know, what you want, what you why, where do you want to take this? And, you know, after a number of exercises, we drilled down to her why story, which was, uh, I want, I worked with these, uh, you know, it's five little girls, they each have a gift from steam. They go and save the mountain girl. That's the mm -hmm. what in Uganda. Yeah. The why we landed on was, um, that she worked in this after school program in a tough part of San Francisco where kids likely outcome was jail, gangs, drugs, mm -hmm. just really unfortunate outcomes. And she worked in this program. And one day she gave a book to this young woman, Marshawn, she was nine or 10 years old. Marshawn had never been given a book before. Uh, Lisa Randolph is the author's name. She comes back two days later, Marshawn, and says, can I have another book? Lisa gives her another book. Marshawn went on to get a full ride at UC Santa Cruz and now lives in DC to create programs yeah. that she met, kind of like the one she met Lisa through for similar yeah, underserved from communities. One, like from that, wow, yeah. And so I said, Lisa, when people ask you why you wrote your book, <laughs> don't tell them about COVID and having spare time and you know wanting to write a book. <laughs> tell them that story. Yeah. And then we started to think about, all right, where do you want to take this thing? How far can we take this? And she was talking about helping girls in California, getting them involved in STEAM education, conservation. Great. She always loved going to the zoo as a kid. And, I, you know, we, as we talked more and more about it, I, I realized like, this is a global story. This is such, yeah. so much bigger than California. So we started to look globally because we were looking at STEAM programs, engineering programs, um, Silicon Valley, weren't getting a lot of progress, kind of like with the film festival. It took a lot right. of iterations to get there. And... <clears throat> One day I said, why don't we try safari operators? Because who would win from this story? I said, why don't we try safari operators in Uganda to take people to where your kid, where the girls go in the book? Yeah. We went on Instagram, started typing in hashtags relevant to the book. And lo and behold, we found this guy, get on Zoom with him, start building rapport, telling him the why story. And he said, you guys need to meet the people. You need to talk to the people that run the safari parks. <laughs> Who's that? Perfect, yeah. <laughs> so he connects us with the number two guy there, Stephen Masaba. We started talking to him. Then we got introduced to the tourism board. I hosted a book launch for them on, online. And they said, you guys need to come do this here. And we ended up spending 12 days in Uganda 
uh, traveled all over the country. They picked us up at the airport in the safari truck. We literally hit uh, four safari parks, loop, did this huge loop around the country. And then they did a big book launch for her where the keynote speaker was the U.S. ambassador to Uganda. They bought hundreds of copies of her book, put them all over the place, got her on every media outlet, every morning show in Uganda. And it's just, it's a relationship that continues to blossom. And that has opened up wow. many more doors for her. And, yeah. you know, I've never sold anything and I'm an introvert is where we I started. was just thinking, like <laughs> coming from somebody who, who's never sold anything and, and is an introvert, she likely, and you likely had no idea just by focusing and crafting the why and the story and really uncovering the layers and the reasons would lead from her writing a book to an international press filled impactful experience like that. And that, I think that I love that story for that reason, because it shows you how powerful um, storytelling, understanding your why, getting clear is what, well, why do you think it's so hard for people to tell their story or get clear on what their story is? That's an interesting one. And I think, you know, we all have excuses for everything, right? I'm so busy. I'm doing this. I've filled my yeah. day with all these things. And I think part of it is sitting down and saying, you know, Hey, what is it my day really looks like? And, mm -hmm. and realizing I'm spending a lot of time maybe doing things I could delegate or automate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's part of it. We kind of get in this mm -hmm. busy trap and our phones are always making us feel super busy, always pinging and all this stuff, right? Um, and I think it's just not knowing where to begin, which is why yeah. you know, I've been working on storytelling for years. I had a pretty good model for it. Then I met this brilliant storyteller, Megan Onan, and she kind of taught me a new version of it. Then I took that and created it into a new version, which I call the stick storytelling formula. Yeah. How do you make your story stick? And so you have a worksheet on your website that people can go and download if they want to try that out. Is that right? Exactly right. Yeah. John C. And, uh, and so I think part of it is this sort of fallacy of, I don't have time. And then gosh, mm -hmm. where do I even, how do I put together a good story that people aren't going to, you know, think is goofy or laugh at me or whatever. And hey. so having that formula is very, very important. Kind of like the Disney thing I referenced earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So really spending the time and because we're so distracted by so many things, um, it's making time for that, which you know, if you're, so now that again, kind of applying this back to the, the organizational change and I'm a, a leader and I have responsibility and I know my team is busy and I know the organization has a million different things going on. It's really important that, would you agree or would you disagree that the leaders who are responsible, do they need to come up with a cohesive story as a team, as well as their own individual stories? Or do you think that one person can have that powerful impact, like the author who went to Uganda. I mean, how, how would you, how would you approach that sort of exercise if you were invited to come in to an organization and they're about to implement a change and you're working with one individual, do you say, this is good, or you bring, bring me all your people. Let's talk about this collectively. Yeah. It, it depends on the structure and the culture inside the firm, but I'm a big believer in getting everybody's buy-in. So for example, yeah. I just yeah. wrapped up a pretty big project around this very concept with a a renewable energy company here in the DC area. Yeah. And it was really, and I got to give them a lot of credit that they were open to let's bring everybody into this story. You know, mm -hmm. what is our mission? What is the story we attach to that? Because mm -hmm. when we go out and tell it and get our customers excited, we want to all be telling the same story. You know, why are we here? What do we yeah. do? Why do we exist? And how are we making kind of the world a better place, if you will? Yeah. And I think having that one cohesive story is very powerful. I think each individual can have their own, you know, why are you excited about, in this case, renewable energy or whatever industry you might be in. Um, but I think having that sort of overarching story is very powerful and people can then kind of blend off of it or, or, or sort of have their adjacent story to it, to have yeah. their own version of it. They can anchor and then create their own. You know, interesting, I have a, a really good friend who is working for a startup company and they have an executive coach that is working with the leadership team. And they meet monthly and the, the coach will ask them questions or, you know, level of trust with each other. How well do you understand the vision? A series of questions. And she told me, and at first I was surprised, but now it makes sense based on what you're saying and some of the stories that you've shared that they scored high in terms of trust and relationships and uh, transparency, but very few of the leadership team was aligned or understood the vision for the organization. Uh, and that kind of gets back to the, why are we here? So I would imagine that is not uncommon for many companies and probably especially <laughs> startup organizations that are still figuring out their MVP or figuring out what the market uh, wants or needs. But that's a really important message to hear. It's important to be cohesive as a team 
and then figuring out your own individual story is how you'll lead and influence your own teams uh, to, to do something differently, to make a behavior change. Um, yeah. yeah. There's one piece I, I, I would like to add to this story, which uh, you just sort of made me think of that I yeah. made to left out from the other part, which is, you know, so many times when we start something, you know, it's our idea and sort of our why story is all about us. I did this because yeah. I always wanted to, I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to save the world. I always wanted to write a book or whatever it might be yeah. or start a renewable energy company. And what really gets people's buy-in is not a story about what's important to you. <laughs> it's a story yeah. about what's important to them. Right. And, yeah. you know, how is it a win for them? And I, I, you know, I keep, I always come back to that thought. Like if I create a win for you, chances of you buying in are much, much stronger, you know, because yes. if there's something new I'm introducing you to, it's going to introduce change, challenges, new learning, and could, you know, create some fear on your end. So well, how is it a win for me? And a story is going to help me understand that much better than some data point. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in the, the change management world, we talk about that. We call it our with them, what's in it for me. So being able to explain the with them for others, um, or at least your understanding, because we could say here are the benefits that you'll get from being a part of this, but people have their own reasons uh, for you know buying in, for finding that with them too. So um, being mindful and respectful of that, which is, it is interesting, you know, I have been in situations where even if the solution, the change is far better than the current state, there's a lot of resistance, there's fear and helping people overcome that fear. You know, maybe you can walk us through that. You were talking before we got on the show a little bit about fear and shame and the influence that has on behavior change and how the storytelling can sort of break through that. But can you kind of walk through that a little bit more? Cause that's a very common thing in organizations, great solution. You're replacing a bunch of processes and things that take up too much time or manual, whatever it might be, but there's still, people don't want to change. Right. It, it change. 70% McKinsey put this data point out a, a yeah. while back. 70% of change initiatives fail. Yeah. Right. And why? And I really believe it comes back to this WIFM thing, to use yeah. your your word, uh, because people's change opens the door to fear, loss, uncertainty, shame, yeah. and s shame is such a psychological threat that it will overwhelm people's ability to dive in and do something interesting or new, uh, because they could show up having to say, "Oops, I screwed up," and tell their partner, their boss, their coworker, "Oops, yeah. I tried this and failed," and now yeah. I feel ashamed. And that's a very powerful force that I think often gets underestimated. So one of the ways to bring them along is to engage them in that journey, giving them a part, a, a seat at the mm -hmm. table, if you will, a voice in that mm -hmm. uh, in that discussion, but also having a story, a why to attach themselves to. Mm -hmm. People want to be involved in something that's going to make a positive change out there, not because I'm your boss and I told you to do it. And it sounds ridiculous to say that out loud. But I have just seen that approach so many times in my life. Yeah. I know it continues to be pervasive. And if we just flip it on its head uh, and bring people into the journey and bring them that story that helps them understand it, the change initiative will be far more successful uh, and have longevity to it, not just die on the vine. Uh, yeah, it's painting when that we don't get that Yeah. Right? When we don't get that buy-in, uh, there's resistance, either uh, uh, very much in our face or the worse happening at the water cooler and you don't even see it. And so everyone's right. fighting you behind the scenes right? and and you don't even know it. And that drags the thing on forever. Yeah. And so being able to help people see themselves in that shared vision for the future, having them be a part of the story is really key. And to your point, it often is an area where uh, it's under, under thought, under emphasized, um, and organizations put out an initiative and say change because we have to, and that ends up not being well, going well for anyone. I would imagine when you, going back to the Uganda story, did you paint that picture of a potential future for um, the author and say, here's where we could go and you know have her envision that? Or was it more of an unfolding of getting into the story and then together you were kind of co-creating what that might, might what that might look like and be? Uh, I really try to co-create all these things and yeah. any kind of change initiative because, of course, then we get people's buying. It's a much more authentic story to them. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things I really like to do is challenge people in, in a very 
non-threatening way, uh, which people have actually used those words to describe how I challenge them. They challenge me in a very non-threatening way, which but I, we still get to where we want Most to, but I don't feel like, you know, I was in trouble, you know, and yeah. I have that feedback from my team on Wall Street a lot, which I appreciated. Uh, but in That's Lisa's probably case, why you were so successful, uh, <laughs> truthfully. Uh, but in Lisa's case, it was really about, you know, trying to push her to say like, you want to help little girls, how, how big can we make this, mm -hmm. right? And get them to just think, in a much bigger and broader way, like we sometimes we get so caught in our own little sort of uh, uh, you know blinders, if you will, we just yeah. sort of see what's in front of us. And when you start to step back a little bit and realize, wait a second, this is a story that can unlock little girls all over the world to say, you know what, I can do this. I can embrace a, a career in STEAM, even though, or STEM or STEAM, right? Uh, STEAM just adds arts to it, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> some people get confused with those. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you start to think about how much you can really have an impact that really helps people think bigger and better. And I always encourage people like, let's shoot for the moon here. And if we only get halfway there, guess what? It's still an amazing outcome. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's a great point. It's easy to create our own ceilings when we go it alone, but go together and you've got this potential that unlocks because you're, you know, you're dreaming and, and pursuing that dream together. That's incredible. Well, I, I, for one, am going to be going back. I actually worked on that worksheet and I was telling you earlier, it was a hard exercise for me to go to, um, partially because I wasn't carving out enough time. So I have to admit that. But also because I I think really, you said it earlier around saying something that, you know, like being living into our honesty or, or saying something that is truly authentic as to why, not just I was bored in COVID. Like what is the real motivating factor here? And um, I'm going to spend some time with that. I'm inspired to do it for my own business, to do it for the clients that I support who are going, uh, the organizations that are going through major changes, the teams that are going through changes. And I can't wait to see how using storytelling will help me influence and help them think differently um, and how we can create a shared win together. So I'm really excited about this. How can people find you, John? How can they reach out, connect with you, learn from you, buy your book? Uh, get coaching? Where are all the places that people can connect with you? Yeah, the, probably the two best places are my website, john with an hc saunders.com uh, forward slash storytelling if they want to find that storytelling worksheet. And uh, it'd be pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, JCS, my initials uh, hyphen optimizer in the name of my book. Yes, I have. Uh, so do those things. And also I'll make sure to include those links in the in the recap so people can easily connect with all of that. If there was one bit of wisdom you'd like to impart on people who are listening to this conversation as it relates to the power of storytelling and how it's made, um, how it's had an impact in your journey that you haven't shared yet, or you'd like to reemphasize, what would it be? You know, stories have to have interesting nuggets of detail, which we all have. We just have to sometimes dig it out, but they also require structure. And yeah. I've said this a couple of times, but I can't emphasize it enough because if you don't have that structure, that flow, like the stick formula, which stands for set up the truth, you know, bring some honesty into it to connect with the audience. I, the insight, see the commitment. I learn these new things. What did I commit to doing and try? Might yeah. not work perfectly, but you have to commit to something and give it a, give it a try. And then K, the key outcomes, this whiff them, right? What's in it for me? You yeah. have to have that balance of sort of interesting details about what happened and also that structure so people can kind of feel like you took them by the hand and walk them through this journey and they can follow along. And so, and then practice it. Yeah. Like you're not going to get the story right perfect the first time. And I promise you, you practice the story four or five times with, you know, Zoom, with a friend, with a, a, a colleague and get feedback. Mm -hmm. You'll get it really, you'll, you'll be so much better at telling that story. It'll start to feel authentic because it is authentic. It's just being able to say it um, out loud. I love that. Well, thank you. That's great wisdom for everyone who's listening and watching. Um, thank you so much for taking time today to be on the Change Leader Insights podcast show. And yeah, have a great rest of your day. Jessica, a pleasure to be here. Thanks again for having me. Thank you.